my brothers and sisters, I come to you this evening with a desire that I can talk to you with plainness. Six years ago, as a new general authority, I was asked to come to BYU and speak at a fireside in a similar setting as we have today. I can remember at that time uh, just looking at the number of missionaries, and we have 1,500 who are here today who will be serving all over the world, and I want to give you my love and the love of the brethren for the great uh, example the elders and sisters are who will be serving throughout the world. About a week or two before the seminar, or this fireside, I received a call from a young lady who asked where my typed talk was. And I, uh, being new at this, said, well, I think I'll just go down and talk at the fireside. I would prefer not to have a prepared talk. That isn't my style. My secretary, Sister Hansen, came to me just a few days before I came and said, Elder Hales, we really should have a talk. You really shouldn't go down there without a talk. And I said, well, if that's what you desire. And I received another call from the university. So I prepared my talk and decided that I would come forward. And then they called and they asked if there are any plans. And I said, I've prepared a talk, but what I'd really like to do when I go down, I'd like to talk informally, maybe just sit on a table and talk to the students. <laughs> and there was no reply on the phone. And <laughs> as I came down and we came down to the uh, Cougar Club and we went to the booster room for our punch and cookies. And I met the people who were there and I thought, my, isn't this a nice group? It was a rather sizable group. And I, coming from my background, thought that was probably the fireside. We finished our punch and cookies and I said a few words to them and I thought that was the easiest fireside I ever had. Then they led me through one corridor downstairs and we went by door after door and then I came out through the entrance and faced what is affectionately called the arena. I now know what the Christians felt like. And as I was walking along, the young lady who was walking next to me, with a twinkle in her eye, the one who had called me said, Elder Hales, uh, do you still want the table? There was a lesson I learned from that. The question I asked myself was, how did I get myself into this situation? And that's going to be the subject I want to talk to you about tonight. I'm not coming here this evening to talk the gospel of Jesus Christ in terms of talking the principles as though you do not know who you are. I know you know who you are, but I'm also aware that some of you have forgotten. And sometimes you make a few mistakes because you don't remember who you are. And so this evening, despite the thousands assembled and the ever-present media, I want to talk to you informally one-to-one, -one. and let you judge for yourself, have you forgotten who you are, and are you acting accordingly, as we are told by President Tanner? In this regard, I'd like to ask the following question. How do you feel the Lord would have you live? If that one question can be in your mind as we talk this evening, and I haven't come so much this evening to try and tell you how to live, but rather have you question yourself. I do not want to give you external things. I want internal things to happen this evening. You are Latter-day Saints. You're sons and daughters of God. You are of an eternal nature. You know the mysteries of God, where you came from, why you're here, and where you're going. I needn't have to go over the details of that. But I do want to ask you one following question. When you are in the company of others, are you their friend? And I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about what a friend is. As we look at this, I'd like to ask you, with the knowledge you have, do you realize that you are different than any other people in the whole world? And I'd hope at the conclusion of this evening, it would not be like Alma and Amulek, as he described in his 14th chapter recorded. First of all, I hope this would be the result. 
After he had made an end to his speaking unto the people, many of them did believe his words and began to repent and search the scriptures. But then it goes on to say, but to the more part of them, they were desirous that they might destroy Alma and Amulek, for they were angry with Alma because of the plainness of his words. I want to talk plainly with you this evening. At the end of this evening, would hope that you will believe in my words and the words of the prophets which I am going to speak to you. I want you to know of my love and the love of the brethren for you and their concern. But you will not realize your potential without prayer, study, obedience, and diligence. And we'll talk about that this evening. We can maybe be helped by a story that I can give you from Johnny Miller. He recently won $500,000 in a $1 million tournament, the first of its kind in the world. He came to speak to our elders when I was a mission president in London. The year before he came, he was the British Open champion. He came as a champion. He spoke as a champion. And it was a marvelous meeting, I was told. All of the elders in the three missions nearby were there and all of the youth in the London area. And it was a magnificent meeting. The next meeting Johnny Miller came to was a year later. He had missed the cut on the second round of the tournament, and the headlines in the London papers and throughout the world was that the champion had not made it to the finals. And that was the news. Now he was faced with the same group of elders and young people, and he had a hard time deciding whether he could make it. I heard this from those who were closest to him, but he decided as a champion to come. He stood and gripping the sides of the podium, he trembled all over. And the first words he said were of such great courage. He said, I don't know why you feel you can go through life without a scorecard. And proceeded to give his testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the scorecard which we have for many of you here today, you have a scorecard. It's the BYU Code of Honor. I'd like to review it shortly with you, to remember once again who you are and to act accordingly. First of all, when you came to this institution, you said that you were desirous to do the following 12 things, and you made a contract and said that you would abide by these things. Let's listen and review them quickly. First of all, you said you would abide by the standards of Christian living taught by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which means the love one for another, to help one another. That Christian living is summarized by my sweetheart, my dear Mary, in teaching our family, her husband and her two boys, with a simple phrase, Thee lift me, and I'll lift thee, and we'll ascend together. I have to ask you this evening, are you lifting one another? Are you ascending, and when someone is down, do you pick them up? Second, be honest in all behavior. Third, respect personal rights. And I might say that means both mind and body. And to be courteous. And to remember who we are. Fourth, respect personal property. Fifth, Obey, honor, and sustain the law. Sixth, avoid drug abuse. Seventh, comply with all college and university regulations. Eighth, obey the word of wisdom. Ninth, live the law of chastity. And the reason you learn to live that law here is that you might learn to live the law of fidelity after marriage. It is the same law. It is the same principle. If you will learn it here, you will have eternal families and return to the presence of God the Father. Would you listen to the voice within you when it comes to living the law of chastity? You don't need to be given a lot of details of what is proper in the dating relationship. But I can tell you this, if you have any doubts or questions in your mind of what the Lord expects of you, if you are asking those kinds of questions, you probably have your answer already. I have a very simple principle to tell you on the law of chastity. 
I was teaching it today to the regional representatives that preside over 80 stakes. It is, if you will write down the word, compassion. C-O-M-P-A-S-S-I-O-N. Compassion is of the Lord. It's service given and rendered. It's vicariously feeling the hurt and the suffering, the loneliness, the depression of others. But if you will draw a line and you will notice that you can divide the word into compassion and then passion. Passion is Satan's way. It is very hard to tell a difference. But if you will draw a line down the word compassion so that passion is shown, you will note a very simple principle. You will cross the line of compassion to passion when you touch each other improperly. And you will know when you cross that line. And passion is the Lord's way of warning us when we have crossed that line. If you will understand that principle, you can also draw another line and you'll see OMP, companion. If you will stay true to your companion, or rather those of you brothers and sisters who are going into the mission field as elders and sisters, you will not err. And those of us who have been married for time and all eternity, if we will listen to our companion, we will remain true and faithful. But if you will really remember the law of chastity, it depends a great deal on touching and improper actions. The next is to observe a high standard of taste and decency. The eleventh, observe prescribed standards of dress and grooming. And here once again I would ask the question of every young lady and every young man as they go out to the university each day and ask themselves in terms of being dressed with taste and decency and with the prescribed standards, for what purpose are you dressed that day? If it is to attract someone else, then you have your answer. Number 12, help others fulfill their responsibilities under this code. And this is where I would like to move to. These codes and ethics are going to remain constant. If I can give you a concept now, which you can think about through the remainder of this talk, I think it will help you a great deal. Thirty years ago, let's say the world was placed here. Or let's say the church, excuse me, was placed here, and the world was here. And there was a, a very short distance between where the world was and where the church standards were. The world has gone out. It's proceeded far to the right and gone very much out of this Marriott Center. There is a tendency to remember where the world was and where the world is now and see the great gap or disparity and then want the church to drift and still have a safe distance from where the world is. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its principles will remain constant. And that is in terms of temporal and spiritual and moral things. And what we have to remember for you and for your children and for your grandchildren is that the church will remain constant and the world will keep moving and that gap is going to become wider and wider. I cannot tell you, but the last 20 years that I've been involved with Europe to see what has happened there and to realize this simple concept that where the world is today, will continue moving. Where the church is today will remain constant. Therefore, be very careful if you judge your actions and your standards for the church on the basis of where the world is and where it's going. And you will find that will be one of the principles for you to remember. Now, to help you with this, I want to talk from the scriptures about Antichrist. Now, that's a hard word. What I'm referring to may help you if I give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Basically, what I'm asking is this. How do you identify those around you who appear faithful but will lead you astray? How does John describe these people? And I also use the Bible dictionary. An antichrist was a word used by the Apostle John 
to describe one who would assume the guise of Christ, but in reality would be opposed to Christ. That would be including non-members as well as members or the priesthood. In a broader sense, it is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel or plan of salvation. Therefore, it means that it will prevent you from obtaining eternal life, and that openly or secretly they are set in opposition to Jesus Christ. The great Antichrist was Lucifer, but he has many assistants, both as spirit beings and as mortals. Now, maybe to help you further, we sometimes think of Peter when he denied Christ. When Peter denied Christ, he didn't deny him as the Savior. He merely denied his association with him because of the fears of what he thought was going to happen to him with the peer group. And that's what happens with many of us. As you look to wonder what is going to happen, and it has always confounded me how one can have more fear of man than God. If you can understand this simple teaching given by Jacob to Sherem, we can learn from the scriptures as John recorded also, even now are there many antichrists whereby we know it is the last time. We will have many among us and from internally. And President Lee used to constantly tell us that the greatest danger to the church was internally not externally. The teachings of the prophets are very helpful. Jacob dealt with Sherem, who preached among the people that there should be no Christ. Sherem was flattering to the people. He was learned. This is true of all such men who take these positions. He had a perfect knowledge of the language and the people. He spoke with much power of speech according to the power of the devil. Sherem sought out Jacob. Isn't it interesting? How those that are faithful are always sought out is the challenge. The adversary wants every one of us in this assembly more than anyone else in the world, and don't ever forget it. I can identify with, with Job when he spoke, when the Lord asked the, uh, the devil when he came among him, where have you been? He said, going to and from on the earth. Don't ever forget that. And Sherem sought out Jacob because he preached the gospel and doctrine of Christ. And Sherem told Jacob that no man knoweth what would transpire many hundred years hence. No man knoweth such things, for he cannot tell or prophesy of things to come. Be careful of those who tell you there is no such thing as prophecy or revelation. The Lord God poured in his spirit into Jacob, and he bore his testimony and it confounded Sherem. There's a lesson here. When in doubt, bear your testimony. Jacob said, Denieth thou the Christ who shall come? And Sherem said, If there should be a Christ, I would not deny him. But I know that there is no Christ, neither has there been, neither ever will be. Then Jacob asked a simple question. Believest thou the scriptures? Sherem said, Yea. Then Jacob testified to him, Then you understand them not. You do not understand them, was the answer he gave, for they truly testify of Christ. And none of the prophets have written or prophesied, save they have spoken concerning this Christ. It has been manifest to me, for I have heard and seen and have been made manifest unto me the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore I know if there be no atonement, Therefore, mankind would be lost. Do you see what happens when one denies Christ and revelation? It takes away repentance. It takes away forgiveness. It means once, once, someone, has, once someone has made a mistake, they can never return back into fellowship in the church. There is no hope. Be careful of those around you who would take hope away from you and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sherem replied to Jacob's testimony, the next thing you'll be asked, show me a sign. He wanted a sign with the power of Holy Ghost, he said, if you know so much. And Jacob replied that he would not tempt God for a sign shown to Sherem. Yet he said, thou wilt deny it if I show it to you, because thou art the devil, 
Nevertheless, Jacob appealed to the Lord and said, Not my will be done. Thy will, O Lord, be done, not mine. As Jacob concluded, the power of the Lord came upon Sherem, and he fell to the earth. He was nourished for many days. Sherem then wanted to repent. He gathered the people around him with the desire to speak to the people before he died. And this is what he said. He spake plainly unto them and denied the things which he had taught them and confessed the Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost and the ministering of angels. And he spake plainly unto them that he had been deceived by the power of the devil and he spake of hell and of the eternity and eternal punishment. And then he said, I fear lest I have committed the impardonable sin, for I have lied unto God. I have denied the Christ and said, I believe the scriptures, and they truly testify of him. But I confess unto God. When he had said these words, he could say no more, and he gave up the ghost. I would hope that our testimonies would be much like that of Jacob talking to Sherem. Recently, I read a survey, and I've wondered why we sometimes lose our perspective. I read a survey by a psychologist at Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University called the Harvard of the Air. They submitted a report to the Federal Aviation Administration. And in 1980, it was recorded in the Stars and Stripes so that the servicemen might read it. The Emory-Riddle people did studies on 700 airplane accidents involving small private airplanes as well as large commercial ones. In 95% of the cases, the accidents involving these aircraft had nothing to do with the equipment failure, nor in the failure of training. As I speak to hear you here this evening, I want you to know that the mistakes that are going to be made will not be because you haven't been taught and that you do not know what you should be doing. It will not be the equipment and the training. And they broke down the accidents made by private by pilot era in five categories. If you can understand these, then you'll start understanding what can happen in your life. The first, invulnerability. The pilot, the young man or woman who says, I can do something dangerous and not get hurt. It's the equivalent of running down the football field to see how close to the sideline you can come and bring up just a little chalk dust. Invulnerability. I can go to the disco, I can associate with certain kind of people, I can have certain kinds of music, I can read certain kinds of literature, I can go to certain kinds of movies, I can handle that. You can't. Be very careful on invulnerability. On the dating relationship, how far do you go, what do you do, all of the questions. Be very careful on invulnerability because it applies to Elder Hales as well as everyone else who is here. Second, macho. This is a pilot saying this is going to make a bigger guy of me. They related in this article a pilot who buzzed a pickup truck, and the second time he hit the pickup truck and wiped out his airplane, the truck, and fortunately the, there were no lives in this particular accident, but the question was asked, basically it said this, and these were the words they used, what would make a guy do something like this? The idea is it's going to make a bigger person out of me in the eyes of those who are around me, in my peer group, or in my own eyes. Not too smart, Emery Riddle says, because this ends up in one losing his life. I think in your case, it can end up in you using, losing an eternal life. Be careful of the macho image, that which makes you a bigger person because you challenge authority. The third is anti-authority. Not filing the proper flight plans, not learning the proper procedures. This is a trait, Emery Riddle said, found in people who hate being told what to do. I submit it's a trait found in people who haven't grown up. I wonder sometimes if you think, wouldn't it be nice to be not told what to do. Wouldn't it be nice to be present, Kimball, and be the president of the church and not be told what to do? Think about that one for a minute. 
he has more pressure placed upon him by Jesus Christ. This is his church. He knows what he wants the prophet to do in this dispensation, and you may wonder why he gives all of his heart, might, mind, and strength as given to us as a qualification of the ministry in the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants in the second verse. There is no halfway commitment. Be careful of anti-authority because that's mixed with the macho image will end up in a lot of heartache in this life. The fourth, impulsivity. To do something impulsively, without thinking. The tendency to do anything to correct a mistake rather than reasoning out the best solution is my definition. And then once we've made a mistake, the cover-up, and it leads from one thing to another, instead of just going in to see the bishop and say, I've erred, I want to get back on that straight and narrow path, let me back in. The last and probably the most important when we're talking of this idea of an antichrist or one who rejects the teachings which they know are true and leads others astray would be defined as follows. I found this one out as a jet fighter pilot. Out of control, we simply said when we were training somebody that the airplane got ahead of him. Many times your lives get out ahead of you. You're here at the university and things are moving very fast. And when you understand as a jet fighter pilot in a single-seated plane, computers working, navigational aids, things moving by at hundreds of miles an hour, thousand miles an hour an hour and more, two and three times the speed of sound, you have to know where you're going and file your flight plans and be very careful on where you fly. In this, it says, in my words, this is when a person feels helpless and says, what's the use? And then, of course, the dangerous impulses, which are all about us, that end up in those fatal accidents. When we were flying low-level flights, we'd be going 300 miles an hour. It was always nice to do that because when you divide 60 into it, you can mark off five miles every minute. You can go faster, but it's a lot easier just to put your little marks on and you know your guidelines along the way, water towers, reservoirs, different kinds of buildings. You're flying at maybe 100 feet, 200 feet above the ground, flying from Georgia to Oklahoma or even farther, and you never come up. But you can do it by your guidelines of what you're doing. Do you feel that you have invulnerability? Do you say, I can handle that. It isn't going to happen to me. Think carefully. On one occasion when I spoke to a number of young ladies, actually on two occasions, we had questions handed to us before we came to the meeting. And one of the questions handed on two occasions that I have had these kinds of meetings, once here at the university and one at another university, the question read something like this. What happens when you're going to have a date with somebody and you know, in this case underlined in red, and you know there's going to be trouble. Now let's think about that for a minute. The first time I received that question, I said, young lady, you're going to wear a very comfortable pair of shoes. <laughs> because when he goes by the dormitory and up the canyon road, you're going to tell him stop and you're going to get out and walk home. As I was driving home feeling very good about myself and being very clever, my wife, as, the sweet, as every sweetheart does, leaned over, put her head on my shoulder, and I expected her to tell me how well I'd done that night. But she leaned over and she said, uh, speaking as a woman, you know they expect more of you than that. The second time I got the question, I think I answered it better. From a mother's point of view, from a woman's point of view, and that is, you aren't going to go on that date. And then I said, that's awfully hard. Wouldn't it be possible to sit down and then describe what the evening's going to be and where you're going to go and what you're going to do and at least give him half a chance? And then if he doesn't come back, you have your answer? She said, it'll never happen. But I think that there are a lot of young ladies 
who could sit down and say, you know, I know your reputation. I know what you're expecting. As my uh, sweetheart once said, when she came back and was told by her father, only to date return missionaries, she wrote him back and she said, Father, I don't think he understands. He was a state. He was down in a priesthood leader in California. He said, some of these fellows are octopuses with testimonies. <laughs> How can we forget who we are? And so I think a young lady ought to be able to say to a young man, all right, I'll go out with you. But if you lay one hand on me, Buster, <laughs> that's it. And that's what we would like to have from the elders and the sisters as they talk and discuss what their evening is going to be like, what their marriage is going to be like. I'd hope that most of you could date a few more than two or three times before everybody in your ward and your stake feels you ought to be married. <laughs> Do you realize the problem we're having? A very subtle thing happened this Christmas. I was watching the television one evening. As you heard, I was an executive handling the international operation for Max Factor. Hundreds of millions of dollars. I know the business. We protected ourselves against having cosmetics for young children. There's a lot of mothers in this country and a lot of older sisters who this Christmas might have bought a little cosmetic kit for a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old. We wouldn't allow that to happen in our organization for one reason. There are two simple principles. Once you start having a young lady put on her eye makeup and put on her lipstick and start to attract those that are around her at an age when they literally do not know what they're doing. And then you start saying, isn't that cute? And any young lady here who started dating heavily and going steady before the age of 16, be careful. I can give you a high correlation. And that is the advice of the brethren who have talked to you and the prophets in the time of my lifetime. Listen to them. It's there for a reason. It's for your protection because they love you. I can handle that, you say. I can put on the makeup. I can put on the nail polish. I can start dating. I can start going steady. Invulnerability? Think about it. After the first small mistake is made in an airplane or in life, you rapidly have succeeding events and this is what starts to happen when you start too young. Once a mistake is made, you ask yourself, what can I do? It's so difficult when you're in a group. You don't want to be lonely. I've had young people tell me I'd rather starve than not have a friend. I'll do anything for a friend. But there's a simple phrase that will help us. Choose you this day whom ye shall serve. You must make a decision today who you will serve. In 2 Timothy, there is some great advice when he talks of those who are associating in his day with friends who are leading them astray. A very simple phrase, from such, turn away. Now many of you are going to say, Elder Hales, I can't turn away from my friends. I can't do that. I love them too much. I'm going to bring them in the gospel. So I'd like to define what I believe Timothy, in that second Timothy and Paul, what was meant by this, from such, turn away. The key is to turn away, not from your friend, but from the ways and the path your friends are taking. And you'll say, is that Christian-like behavior? I want to save them. I know that if I associate with them, I can influence them for the good. There's an Indian phrase, which I was taught many years ago as a young man, that before you judge someone or make a judgment, you should walk in their moccasins and go their way. I'd like to change that a little bit and say, turn away from the ways of your friend. 
and the path they are on. If you will depart and go on the correct straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life, as spoken of by Nephi and many others, then once you have your life straightened out, invite them to come over and walk in your moccasins on the correct path. And I think you'll begin to understand you don't have to reject your friends. You don't have to give them up. You do have to give up their ways and the path they're taking. And it takes great courage. It's probably the most difficult thing I'm going to ask you to do this evening. But you have to get on the correct path and then by example, lead them. There are many things with friends. Zizram, when Alma and Amulek were teaching him, he also trembled with fear and wanted to come in the gospel. He wanted to convert the people, and when they made Alma and Amulek watch the people as they were being burned, Zizram went to the people and said, these people have the truth. He'd been taught the gospel. He was converted, but they didn't listen to him. They cast him out. Many of us turn around, go on a mission, and come to the university. I want to ask you a very simple question. What are the others, elders and sisters, who are still back dragging Main Street? You've turned away. Do you have any responsibility? And think for a minute. Has your responsibility and your conduct of what happened behind the barn or on a date, and you've repented and gone your way, do you have any responsibility for those left behind? Think for a moment. Has your action left someone in the fire by your actions? What kind of friend are you? Will you go back and lift them and write them and bear your testimony to them? I ask the Lord's blessings to be with you as a friend. There's a marvelous lesson learned by those who travel in the islands. A very flat basket, not very large, and when they catch crabs, they place them in the basket. If you place one crab in the basket, it crawls right out. If you place two crabs in the basket, every time one crab starts to crawl out of the basket, it is pulled back in by the other crab. Does that tell you something of maybe who your friends are? What is the definition of a friend? A friend is someone who makes life easier to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they deviate from the path and lead you away, it does not matter what kind of car they drive, who their parents are, how fancy they are on the football field or the basketball floor or the baseball field. It does not matter who their parents are. You have to ask yourself, do they make life easier? And do they help you out of the basket and go with you? I learned a great lesson as a young man. My father sent me out to work on a ranch. I worked with Uncle Frank Hatch in Skull Valley and my cousin Jay and others that I loved very much. And I learned a great deal about the gospel out there as well as why I was sent because I was told I could never learn how to work if I grew up in New York. My father being from Idaho. <laughs> As I went out on the ranch, I found there were thousands and thousands of acres for the cattle to be in. Why on earth did they go up to the fence and stick their head through it? As a boy from New York, I could not understand that. I'd say, Uncle Frank, they got all those thousands of acres out there, and that's the way it is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Within the principles of the gospel, we can have such great times culturally. We can laugh and enjoy life. What fun it is. And yet, what do we do? We all go up against the fence sometimes. We keep going down the fence to try and find the hole in the South 40. And then when we find it, we romp on out and say, hey, isn't this great? We go out on Highway 90 and then we get hit by a semi-truck. <laughs> and we wonder what on earth happened to us. And then we blame, I'm sure those poor cattle who get hit, blame the farmer for not keeping the fence mended. 
I would hope that we could understand another lesson I learned that summer from my uncle. It was about coyotes and with the sheep. You know, it's very clever. They take the little pups, the little coyote pups, and mother and father coyotes send their pups down to go out and play and frolic. And the little lambs who are secure in the fold look over there and say, boy, doesn't that look like a lot of fun? And they leave to go play with the coyote pups. And then the coyotes come down and kill them. Now alone, one coyote, if stood up to, will run. But as a group, and as you go out, you see the things that are happening, and you say, wouldn't it be fun to go out and experience a little bit of that? In fact, I'd experience a little bit of that. It'll make me a better person. I'll relate better to those who are sinning than to those that are transgressing. <laughs> In fact, I had a young man the other day say to me, I said, how is your testimony? And he said, well, I, I want to go out. And I said, well, do you really feel you know the scriptures? He said, no, I'm going to let my companion do that. I just want to go out. I think I can relate to all the people who've had some problems. <laughs> and I said, what happens when you have a companion who has the same mentality you have? He looked at me, and a broad grin came over his face, as you have a point there, Elder. And so he went about studying the scriptures, and I have another picture of him from when I first talked with him, and his stake president told me of his love. Will you understand the peer group? You know I have the problems of dieting like everyone else, and I've learned a simple little thing. Isn't it interesting when you tell someone that you're on a diet? how many candy pushers there are around, <laughs> and dessert pushers, how they want to kind of drag you in back into the basket instead of helping you and going on the diet with you. Those are the little things I want you to think about. Thee lift me, and I'll lift thee, and we'll ascend together. President Nathan Eldon Tanner told us a very simple story in the temple one day. He was moved by it, and so were we. He was just a young lad. Father left him to tend a cow. He did not come from a wealthy home. The cow was the most prized possession the family had. It gave him sustenance and food. Father was going into town and asked Nathan Eldon if he'd take care of the cow. Nathan Eldon, present Tanner, then a young boy, had all of his friends over, and they produced to have a rodeo. They rode that cow and kicked it, and I can see a lot of smiles on the young men from Idaho. <laughs> Father came back early, fortunately. There'd been no time in which they'd had to milk the cow, and the second milking was approaching, and things were getting serious with that animal. Father came home. He didn't yell at Nathan Eldon, didn't strike him, but sat him on a fence post and said, Nathan Eldon, remember who you are, you're a tanner, and then proceeded to give him a little bit of his heritage and what he expected of him, and that he was a priesthood holder. Then he gave the words which President Tanner has told us and gives to us virtually every time before a conference and before we leave his presence. Remember who you are and act accordingly. I hope you haven't forgotten. You are a child of God. He has sent you here has given parents who are kind and dear. Lead me, guide me, walk beside me, help me find the way. Teach me all that I must do to live with him someday. Sometimes I think we go through life in a speedboat. And as we go through the harbors of life, we never look over our shoulder at the sailboats and the lifeboats and the dinkies that are swamped in the wake of our actions. I would hope that you'd start looking over your shoulder. Do you really understand? While you may have been cruising the main streets back home, as I said, and you've turned and left, what is left behind you? You are the most chosen of all the spirit children on earth. It is your responsibility and that of your posterity to lift 
to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. It has been placed upon you in this dispensation. You are not here by accident. You are here to lift. But do you know how hard it's, it is to lift somebody if you're standing in the mud? Or even more, how hard it is to lift somebody if you're standing on their shoulders, weighing them down? In closing, I'd like to give you my testimony. And in doing so, I'd like to help you to ask you to tell you how to have a relationship with the Lord and talk just a little bit about repentance. There are four steps you have to make to have a relationship with the Lord. First, prayer. Individual prayer, companion prayer, and family prayer. Then after you've prayed to your Heavenly Father, and thanked him for all that he's given. And I'd like to ask each one of you, as you depart this evening and go home, to have a prayer of thanksgiving for all the things you have. Next, you've got to study, individual study and companion study. And if it's in the family, you've got to have family study. Once you have prayer and study, then you must become obedient. And after obedience, diligence working with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength. That diligence is to help others. My sweetheart went to a Relief Society conference. On the back of the wall, there was a sign, the theme of the day. If you d don't go, you can't get it, said. She said, I understand the theme, that if we don't go to Relief Society, we can't get what is there. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is built on a different foundation. If you don't go, you can't give. There is a big difference between getting and giving. And many of us spend our time worrying about the gettings of life rather than the givings. As I close, may I ask you to think of repentance. And as we think of the Antichrist among us, if you'll go study Korahor, what he will he say? Religion, that's the tradition of our fathers. Repentance or forgiveness, it's a derangement of the mind. All hope is taken away. Now repentance. We know that we recognize we've done wrong. We realize that we will not do it again because the scriptures say to us, how do we know that a man repenteth? because he repenteth and does it no more. So we recognize those two very quickly. Restitution is a very interesting element of repentance. We all recognize the forgiveness of others, but many of us forget the most difficult part, forgiving ourselves. That is the adversary's greatest tool. We do not forgive ourselves. We do not allow the Spirit of the Lord to come with us and to be able to guide us. If you can remember that simple fact of repentance, that after you have repented, the Lord forgives you long before you forgive yourself. But remember the simple scripture of grabbing hold of the plow and not looking back. You've made a mistake. You recognize you've done wrong. You don't do it again. But then the most important part you forgive others, forgive yourself, and then you grab hold of that plow and you never look back. You don't talk about it. You leave it up to the Lord to let you know when it's behind you. And then you cannot have someone come to you and remind you, you made a mistake. And when you go out on a mission, you won't say to yourself, I'm a hypocrite, I really shouldn't be here. I've made a mistake. Because if you teach repentance and if you live it, you can bear testimony of it that you truly can forgive yourself and the Lord will forgive you. My last statement in giving you a testimony and my love for you is the very simple principle that was taught during a trip with the a cappella choir of Brigham Young University. We were traveling through Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. I had one of the sweetest experiences I've ever had in my life. As we went through Poland, everywhere they sang in the cathedrals, 90% of the people are in the chapels. 
and in the cathedrals on Sunday. And everywhere the choir sang, they would place their hands or their fist over their heart to say, we bear our testimony to what you sing. We were in Gdansk, Warsaw, Poznan, Chestakova, where the Black Madonna was, and they sang in all the cathedrals there. But the special occasion that happened happened at Spital, Austria. They'd been singing with all of the choirs in competition, a cappella choirs, from many countries throughout Europe. The German Democratic Republic, which is East Germany, West Germany, Czechoslovakia. They had other countries, Austria, many others. When the competition was over with and the judges were out, each of the each of the a cappella choirs had dispersed in the crowd. In their tuxes and formals, our a cappella choir had gone to a fourth tier way above the platform where they'd been performing in the castle. They were in their tuxes and in their formals. They really looked like angels. And then as they were led in singing, what a beautiful thing happened. They sang from the words of Robert Conduct's The Redeemer this very special song, Behold. These are the words at the end of the great teachings of the first four principles of the gospel. How faith in the Lord Jesus Christ gives you the strength to repent and turn around. How after turning around in repentance, we go through the waters of baptism and are cleansed to have the Holy Ghost and on a straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life as defined by Nephi in the 32nd chapter and in the, in the 31st chapter. And in the 21st verse, these are the words that have been penned, and I read them to you with my closing testimony. And I want to tell you the moving experience as my wife and I, as sweet Mary and I stood among those of the choir of Czechoslovakia as these words sang, Behold, and as it rang through, all of a sudden that palace and courtyard became a tabernacle. And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. And there is none other way nor name given unto heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost which is one God, amen. I add my testimony to that of Nephi. I know that God lives and that Jesus is the Christ and that this is the way and that he does love us and that if you and I are true and faithful, if we will go to the temple, be sealed for time and all eternity, if we will stay on that straight and narrow path, if we will love one another, if we will help one another, if we will lift one another, we will return back into the presence of our Heavenly Father for time and for all eternity. But it all depends on what kind of friends we have. And I want you to know that if those in this assemblage could realize who they are and act accordingly, that we would understand, as recorded in the 58th section, that the power is in you to stand alone. You know that you have the power within you to do that which you want and which you came here to do to return back into the presence of your Heavenly Father. I ask the Lord's blessings to be with you and express again my great love for you and hope that that which we have talked plainly about this evening will ponder and have you think. And as you leave this assembly with the resolve to do better and if you start to slip, Please remember the many friends you have sitting on this stand, the priesthood of God, the Relief Society, and all those who stand in waiting to assist you. May the Lord's choicest blessings be, be yours, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.